I'm on my way to St. Clement's Church. To do this, I've crossed the railway which so mercilessly cut the old town in two in 1854. I was able to use the footbridge, but until the electrification of the line and the building of the road bridge near the crooked billet, the only way across the tracks for horse-drawn or motorised vehicles was by the level crossing. In all, there were six level crossings between the marshes and South End. By the railway near the ship inn was what was called the marketplace and matchmaker's corner, but I'm making my way up Lee Hill to Church Hill. Church Hill is one of the many delights of Leon C. There are glimpses of splendid houses and gardens on each side and quaint terraces of weather-boarded cottages. And every step of the way reveals another viewpoint across the roofs of Lee and over the estuary. Having seen Lee from the marshes and then explored the old town and its high street, I've chosen to come for my third painting to the top of the hill and paint a view of Lee Hill from the churchyard of St Clement's Church. There are several interesting and moving memorials in the churchyard of this fine 13th century church. None more so than the memorial to the crew of the cockle boat Renown, killed on the 1st of June 1940 on their way back from Dunkirk. Frank Osborne, Leslie Osborne, Harry Noakes and Harold Porter lost their lives. In the close-knit community of Lee, not a single household was not touched by grief. Also in the churchyard is the tomb of Mary Ellis. The inscription tells us that she was a virgin of virtuous courage and promising hope and died on the 3rd of June 1609, aged 119. On top of the tomb is a weathered and worn altar stone. This is known as the Cutlass Stone and legend has it that the naval press gangs sharpened their cutlasses here while they waited for the church services to end so that the able-bodied youth of the town could be caught as they left the church. However, the sound of the steel on Mary Ellis's tomb would alert the congregation and the youths would be hidden away until the coast was clear. My painting of Lee Hill is now well underway. Lee Hill was once a more important thoroughfare than it is today. For horse-drawn vehicles, it was the only way down into the old town. And in earlier times, the lower part was called Horse Hill. The reason it takes a zigzag route down the hill is to minimise the gradient. The hurly-burly of Lee Broadway and the parades of shops are a comparatively modern innovation. As recently as the last quarter of the 19th century, St Clement's served a predominantly rural parish and most people lived down in the old town. During the 19th century, the population increased from less than 600 to more than 3,600 and this figure had increased fivefold by the 1920s and just after the Second World War, stood at 40,000. Victorian and Edwardian businessmen soon discovered the delights of living in Lee and commuting by train to London or by tram or train to South End. The tram terminus was by St Clement's Church. And so they built their seaside villas with ornate ironwork and sea view verandas, like these on Lee Hill. The buildings on the right-hand side of the road date back much further. There is Prospect House, which indeed has a very fine prospect. From this point, the Customs and Tide Surveyor and the Trinity House pilots in the days of sail 
watched and waited for the merchant shipping to arrive from around the world. Thorpes the Undertaker had their funeral parlour down on the right. They had been there since 1838, but when they moved to new premises in the Broadway, the building became a private residence. A building that still exists beyond the lower wall of the churchyard is Herschel House, once the home of the Reverend Ridley Herschel. Which brings us to the story of one of Lee's greatest benefactors. I mean, of course, Lady Olivia Sparrow. Lady Olivia Sparrow was the lady of the manor of Lee Hall in the early part of the 19th century and took the well-being of the people of Lee very seriously. In 1832, she was responsible for providing the old town with a fresh water supply via a well and a pump in the centre of the Strand. The remains of this well can still be seen in the High Street to this day. A second well, sunk on Bell Wharf, followed in 1836. Lady Olivia is remembered by several street names in Lee. Olivia Drive, for instance, and Lord Roberts Avenue was named after both her husband and son. Manchester Drive is named after her daughter, the Duchess of Manchester. Lady Olivia is perhaps best remembered for founding the first actual school in Lee. This was in 1834. Before then, there had been several dame schools run in private houses and providing a rudimentary education for those who could afford it. Lady Olivia Sparrow's school, however, was purpose-built, with departments for girls, boys and infants. Her aim was to improve the educational and moral standards of the poor of Lee, which was said to be at a low ebb. In addition to the school building, which can still be seen on Lee Hill, she provided funds for a schoolmaster and a schoolmistress. The schoolmaster she recruited was a strange but inspired choice. He was Dr. Ridley Herschel, a Polish Jew who had studied in Germany and having been converted to Christianity, became a lay preacher. Now he ran Lady Olivia's school, the name being changed to Herschel School, and his boundless enthusiasm had a profound effect upon the people of Lee. Though he only remained in Lee for two years, he made many converts. Lady Olivia Sparrow and Ridley Herschel's innovative and radical evangelism did not meet with the approval of the Reverend Robert Eden of St. Clements. In 1847, he founded a rival school, the National School, which was built on Church Hill adjacent to the churchyard. The Reverend Eden was a high churchman and never ever saw eye to eye with Lady Olivia, whose beliefs were low church. By 1890, the administration of Lee schools had passed to a school board and there was a need to accommodate many more pupils. A new school was built in North Street and this school has evolved into the splendid school it is today. Right now, if you remember, we've been looking at the Victorians. Right? We've only just started looking at the Victorians. And the Victorians was that age when Queen Victoria was on the throne. And one of the things that we said we wanted to find out about was our school. Because our school is a very old school. Do we think our school was here when the Victorians were alive? Yes! yes. Mm. Who can remember when our school was built? It was on a timeline I gave you. I wanted to find out more about the school and was kindly invited by the junior school head teacher, Martin Frampton, to join the third year for a history lesson. Inside their house. Inside. Inside. The children have been working on a project about Victorian times and today Maureen Sealeaf, the deputy head teacher, will be cleverly using the school building itself, which retains many good examples of Victorian architecture, as a teaching aid. In the classroom, the tour of the school and the features to look for are discussed. Evidence. Evidence. Right, we're going to have a look around the school. Now, you can work with a friend if you want to. We're going to go around the school, but we're going to start outside. 
Right, so we're going to have to put our coats on. Right, take a sheet. Now it's time to go outside and discover the history of the school for ourselves. With Mrs. Sealeaf in the lead and helped by teaching assistant Pauline Palmer, Year 3 set about making lists of the features they find and noting where they find them. Right, shall we have a little wander around then? Hooray! Right, what can you see? What can you see? To meet changing needs and modern standards, the school has developed over the years. But the new additions blend sympathetically with the original buildings. It has been beautifully done, but the young detectives are soon experts at picking out the original features from the new. The local press records our activities for posterity, reminding us that everything we do today becomes tomorrow's history. I'm going to show you something very, very special. So, I think I know what they're doing. Follow me. I've forgotten all about it. It has dates. It's refreshing to see that today's pupils are encouraged to think of local history not as a dry academic subject, but as something which is all around us in our everyday lives. It's something to enjoy, something to be part of. I think we can say that the past is alive and well and living in Lee. And it would seem it's in safe hands for the future. My picture is just about finished. It occurs to me that my location here in the churchyard of St Clement's Church is a tranquil oasis in a busy, congested town centre. And Lee has many such delightful spots where one can sit quietly and many viewpoints where one can enjoy the vista over the estuary and marshes. But now it's time to mount the watercolour and put it in a frame.
stroll around Lee at any time of the year is a joy. It is picturesque, and in spite of modernization and the loss of many old historic buildings, there is still plenty to see for those who take the trouble to look for it. And in the summer months, the town is alive with the excited cries of youngsters, enjoying the sun and the sea. The beach provides the simple pleasures of the seaside, the timeless delights of countless children who go down to the sea with bucket and spade. Whether to sunbathe and relax on the shore, or to take to the water in a pleasure boat, young and old alike experience to the full the many and varied delights of Leon Sea. I've thoroughly enjoyed coming to Lee and painting the town. Thank you.